Watson, The Final Problem, by Bert Cools and Tim Marriott, from the original story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. If you enjoy this recording, please do consider making a donation. Thank you. Watson, The Final Problem. That was a power, a deep, organising power that pervaded London like a fog which crept out of the very stones. A man who sat motionless like a spider at the centre of its web, but that web had a thousand radiations and he knew every quiver of each one of them. He was the organiser of half that was evil and nearly all that was undetected in this great city. And he was unmasked by Sherlock Holmes, hunted, tracked down and named Moriarty, the Napoleon of crime. No, 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 that won't do. According to Holmes, I'm far too fond of telling my stories wrong end foremost, and I'm afraid it's true. So let me tell you how everything actually started. Get that stretcher over here. Those two men to go back. No, leave him. Leave him. Keep pressure on that wound. Move, man. Murray, Murray, bring my bag over. Ah! Ah! The war in Afghanistan brought honours and promotion to many. But to me, it brought nothing but misfortune and disaster. I took two bullets from a Jezel rifle. Filthy things, one in the leg, one in the shoulder. The bones were shattered. I would have fallen into the hands of the enemy, but somehow Murray, my orderly, threw me across a pack horse and got me safely back to the British lines. Brave man, dead now. I was worn and weary and sick of the sights that I'd seen, and I came down with enteric fever. For a time my life was despaired of, and I despaired of life. Finally, weak and emaciated, I was dispatched home. Six weeks at sea in an overcrowded troopship, and, and then I landed at Portsmouth with my health in ruins and my nerves in shreds. I was barely able to help myself, let alone anyone else. You know, when you apply to medical school, they ask you why you want to become a doctor. I'd told them I wanted to make a difference in the world, I wanted to be of use. That's what I was born to do, I told them. I was young and I was innocent and they'd heard it a thousand times before, of course, but the fact was, I genuinely believed it. I really did think that one man could make a difference, and all through my training I still believed it. I was the very model of the idealistic young doctor. Then, after I qualified, I joined the army and was dispatched to India, to the northwest frontier, an idealistic young man in an ancient land. But I soon discovered that an Afghan bullet doesn't care how old you are, a bomb doesn't care about your lofty ideals, and a, a Khyber knife doesn't give a damn as it slits your throat. I saw friends and comrades butchered in front of my eyes, and I grew up pretty fast. Before, before those two bullets closed that particular chapter and sent me home. So there I was, back home. Well, naturally enough, I gravitated to London. To that great cesspool that sucks in all the loungers and idlers of the Empire, where I too could drain away to... nothing. I stayed for some time at a private hotel in the Strand, leading a comfortless, meaningless existence and spending what little money I had much too freely. It was only when the state of my finances became genuinely alarming that I finally woke up to reality and realised I had to make a complete alteration to the way that I was living. I made up my mind to leave the hotel and take up quarters somewhere rather less pretentious and considerably less expensive. As fate would have it, it was on that very same day that I ran into an old colleague from Bart's Hospital, young Stamford. <laughs> By God, it was a pleasant thing to a lonely man to find a friendly face in that great grey wilderness. I took him off to lunch. 
hang the expense, and I told him I was looking for comfortable lodgings at an affordable price. He laughed. I got rather short with him, scoffing at my splendid newfound resolution, and I demanded to know just what was so damned amusing about it. Sorry, he said, but you're the second man today who said those very words to me. The other chaps found his comfortable rooms all right, but the rent's too much for his pocket, and he can't persuade anyone to go halves. Well, that threw a different light on things. I was the very man for him. I told Stanford I'd prefer sharing with someone to being on my own, as long as he was studious and quiet and easy to get along with. Stanford looked at me rather strangely over his wine glass. You don't know him yet, he said. Oh, it did my heart good to be back at Bart's. History, tradition, memories. I had some very happy... And suddenly, there he was. Stamford introduced us. Dr Watson, Mr Sherlock Holmes. Holmes greeted me cordially, asked me how I was, and shook my hand with a strength I'd hardly have given him credit for. Then he said... You've been in Afghanistan, I perceive. I was astonished. I asked him how on earth he knew. He chuckled to himself. <laughs> Never mind, he said. And that was how it all began. Well, I dare say you know most of the rest. You know about the science of deduction and detection, the cases, the clients, the triumphs, the way Scotland Yard's finest used to call at our rooms in Baker Street asking for his help. You're familiar with the chemical experiments in the sitting room, the indoor target practice, the tobacco in the slipper, the unanswered letters stabbed to the mantelpiece with the jackknife, the cocaine. And you'll forgive me a moment of immodesty, but it's thanks to me that you know these things. John H. Watson, companion, comrade, best-selling author, biographer, chronicler, friend. I like to think that. Friend. And now it falls to me to tell you something that you don't know. Sherlock Holmes is dead. Holmes died on the 4th of May, 1891. Yes, that's right. Almost exactly three years ago to the very day. And you're wondering, I imagine, how can it be that you didn't hear at the time? No newspaper headlines, no obituary, no announcement of a funeral, no tributes, nothing. Nothing. It's true that he wasn't as famous then as he became later, but even so, I, I wondered myself at first. And then I realised. Holmes had a brother, Mycroft, seven years his senior. Holmes told me that he holds a junior office in the civil service, auditing the books for some of the government departments. Well, I believed him, of course, and until I actually met the man. Imagine. Imagine Sherlock Holmes's mind, his sharpness, his intellect, his insights into the darkest depths of men's souls, his sheer oddness. Imagine all that, magnified, intensified, even more disturbing. And I was supposed to believe that such a man audits the books? One look at his eyes, and I knew that there was far more to Mycroft Holmes than that. Not that I ever raised it with Holmes. It was none of my business, but, but there were occasional clues. Telegrams from Whitehall, vital information that helped us crack a case. And on at least one occasion, an official command summoning Holmes to Buckingham Palace, no less. And these notes were always signed simply M. Oh, yes. And when, three years ago, nothing appeared in the papers, I did some deducing of my own. Who else could have been responsible? But I am digressing, and I apologise. I'm putting it off. <laughs> Holmes was fond of saying that all I cared about in my stories was the drama, the colour, the sweep of the investigation, <laughs> the thrill of the chase. What he wanted was clinical accounts full of cold, hard facts, analysis, logic, details, science. Look, take the speckled band. Do you remember that one? They were a young woman's dying words, the speckled band. There was no visible cause of death, and her body was found in a sealed bedroom. Her sister came to Baker Street, shaking in terror of her life. 
what a case. The locked door and windows, the mysterious noises in the night, the vigil in the dark, the low whistle. Holmes exploding into action. Do you see it, Watson? Do you see it? The band! The speckled band! I'll never forget the sight. The flickering candlelight. Holmes' eyes gleaming as he thrashed out with his cane. It was a snake. A swamp adder. The deadliest snake in India. Holmes struck at it and drove it back. Back through the vent into the next room. Where it turned in rage on its handler. He was dead in seconds. The girl's stepfather. The killer killed. Holmes wanted me to call that story an analytical account of the Roylet Stoner inheritance case with particular notes upon the training and employment of reptiles as murder weapons. <laughs> I ask you. It was always the same. It didn't matter which case. What you've done is akin to putting a romance in the fifth proposition of Euclid, Doctor. I don't know if you've ever read the fifth proposition of Euclid, but I have, and you can take it from me that it could do with a bit of romance or a murder or a good kidnapping. So I plead guilty as charged, and I also plead guilty to making his name famous and bringing him in a goodly amount of work. He knew that, of course. He, he never said it, but that was just his way. <laughs> yes, I know, I know, I know. I know. I'm, I'm still not getting to the real point, I know. But allow me one more digression, if you will. It's, well, it is a relevant one this time. Holmes introduced me to a world I scarcely knew existed. An endless parade of villains, policemen, murderers, blackmailers, clients. One particular client. Miss Mary Morstan was seven and twenty. A sweet dainty, fragile creature with soft blue eyes that were beautifully spiritual and sympathetic, even in the face of personal tragedy and fear. Holmes raised his eyebrows when I showed him what I wrote about her later, but I stood by it then and I stand by it now. In an experience of women which extends over many nations and over three separate continents, I had never looked upon a face which gave a clearer promise of a refined and sensitive nature. Well, I, I did what I always did. I offered to leave her alone with Holmes so that she could talk in confidence. And she asked me to stay. Love is a wondrous subtle thing. In the midst of a terrifying business, as dark and as dreadful as any we'd encountered, my heart went out to her and hers to me. But I was still weak, still far from well, a man with no prospects and no more than a half-pay army pension to support myself. And thanks to Holmes, thanks to us, a fabulous lost treasure was found, and Mary Morstan was an heiress, one of the richest women in the realm. What right had I even to look at her? And then we all gathered, the treasure chest was opened, and it was empty. The thief, knowing he was about to be caught, had scattered the whole lot into the Thames. Jewels, pearls, gold, silver, all lost for ever. And I breathed, thank God. She looked at me. She knew why I'd said it. I could see it in her face, in, in those wonderful eyes. But I had to put it into words. I said thank God, I told her. Because now I am free to tell you that I love you, Mary. I love you as truly as a man ever loved a woman. Her reply is etched in my memory. In that case, my dear John, I say thank God too. All this is by way of explaining why, on the 24th of April, 1891, I'd moved out of the Baker Street rooms and was living here, in Kensington, a married man with a new medical practice of my own. I hadn't seen Holmes for quite some time, though, of course, I'd been following his activities in the papers. I knew that he was abroad on some delicate mission for the French government, which is why it came as something of a shock that late that evening he suddenly burst unannounced into my consulting room. 
He edged his way along the wall. He slammed the shutters on the window and bolted them. He looked terrible, thinner and paler than ever, and his knuckles were burst and bleeding. He tried to light a cigarette, but his hands were shaking so much I had to do it for him. I'd rarely seen Sherlock Holmes in fear of anything, but by God he was scared then. Air guns, he said. I'm frightened of air guns. Air guns? What the devil could he possibly mean? I made him sit down. I, I poured him a drink and dressed his hand. Eventually he pulled himself back to something more like his usual self and, and apologised for calling so late. Then he asked if he could leave by scrambling over the back wall of my garden. What was, what was all this about? I, he turned to me, as serious as I'd ever seen him, and asked if Mary was in. I told him she was away on a visit, and he nodded. Good. That makes it easier. Watson, will you come away with me to the continent? The continent? Where? No, anywhere. It's all the same to me. The man I knew would never propose a holiday, let alone an aimless one. He saw my expression. He pulled himself to his feet, and he roamed the room. I waited. You've probably never heard of Professor Moriarty. No, 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 and there's the genius and the wonder of the thing. No one has heard of him. That's what puts him on a pinnacle in the records of crime. His life has been extraordinary. Good birth, excellent education. He held the chair of mathematics at one of the smaller universities, but he had hereditary tendencies of the most diabolical kind. A criminal strain ran in his blood. Dark rumours gathered around him in the university town, and eventually he was forced to resign his chair and come down to London. These are the public facts. That's what the world knows, and that's all the world knows. For years now, in every kind of case, robberies, forgeries, abductions, blackmail, murder, scandals, scandals reaching to the very highest in society, I have felt his malign presence. For years I struggled to break through the veil that surrounds it and shields it, and at last the time came. I saw the thread, I seized it and followed it, and it led me through a thousand cunning twists and windings, straight to Moriarty. He's a genius, a philosopher, an abstract thinker. He's a true master of his art. He commits no crimes himself, he delegates, he issues his orders and they're passed down through all the layers of his organisation. Only those agents at the very top have direct contact with the man at the apex of the pyramid. I had all the evidence, but he was so ringed around with protection that I couldn't move against him. I'd woven my net, but couldn't pull it tight. And then he made a slip. Just one tiny slip, but it was enough. I went to Scotland Yard. Oh, I had a hard time making them believe me, but I succeeded in the end. And together we laid our plans. Separate, simultaneous swoops on every level of the organisation, timed to the second, so no warning can be given. In three days, the Professor, with all the principal members of his gang, will be in the hands of the police. And I'd done all this in the most profound and desperate secrecy. One hint of what was planned, one minute vibration of that massive web, and all my months of effort would have been for nothing. Then, this morning, I was in our old rooms in Baker Street, playing to concentrate my mind and going over the plans, when the door opened. It was him, the very man himself, standing on my threshold, his appearance was quite familiar to me. He's extremely tall and thin. His forehead domes out in a white curve. When he's deep in thought, he has a habit of slowly oscillating his head from side to side. It makes him look curiously reptilian and repugnant. We exchanged pleasantries, and he produced a memorandum book. You crossed my path on the 4th of January. On the 23rd, you incommoded me. By the middle of February, I was seriously inconvenienced by you. 
At the end of March, I was absolutely hampered in my plans, and now, at the close of April, I find myself placed in such a position through your continual persecution that I am in positive danger of losing my liberty. You must drop it, Mr. Holmes. You really must, you know. You hope to place me in the dock. I tell you that I will never stand in the dock. You hope to beat me. I tell you that you will never beat me. If you are clever enough to bring destruction upon me, then rest assured that I shall do exactly the same to you. Holmes had been shaken by the confrontation. He tried to hide it, but I knew him far too well. And he was right to be concerned. He told me that not an hour later he went out and a two-horse van drove furiously straight at him. He only saved himself by a second. Two other attacks followed in quick succession, and finally, while he was on his way to me, he was attacked in an open street by a rough with a cudgel. I knocked him down, Watson, and the police have him but I can tell you that absolutely no connection will be traced between him and the former professor of mathematics. No connection whatsoever. But I shall have him, Doctor. I shall have him. Then will come the greatest criminal trial of the century, and the rope for all of them. I tell you, my friend, it will go down as the finest bit of thrust and parry work in the entire history of detection. It was a, a fantastic story, an extraordinary tale, and... He was asking me to go off with him to God only knew where. Holmes was not a man to run away from a confrontation, and no more was I. I'd be lying if I said I didn't have my doubts about the whole thing, the life he led. Wasn't it enough to take its toll on the strongest of men, to unseat even the surest of brains? Holmes was in a more frantic state than I'd ever seen him. I asked him again, why did we have to go abroad? He told me the plans were so well laid it wasn't necessary for him to be there for the actual arrests. Getting away, getting out of the country was the obvious, the necessary thing for him to do, he said. He was practically begging me to go with him. And I agreed. What choice did I have? If there had been several attacks already, then surely there would be more. And to be honest, in any case, I... I didn't think it was safe to let him be on his own, the state he was in. If it meant an unplanned trip to heaven knew where, well, wasn't it worth it? The man obviously needed my help, and I wasn't about to turn my back on him. I pressed him to stay the night, but he, he wasn't having it. it. It's too dangerous for you, he said. He gave me instructions that I had to follow to the letter. To the letter! You are now playing against the cleverest rogue and most powerful syndicate of criminals in Europe. Oh, those instructions. I had to send my luggage, the barest minimum, to Victoria Station that evening, and in the morning I had to take a hansom cab, not the first or the second which came along, but the third. It had to be the third. I had to drive not to the station, but to the strand end of the Lowther Arcade, and I must on no account tell the driver the destination, but hand him a piece of paper with it written down. Holmes saw my reaction to that, but... I don't think it registered. That was the clearest sign of all, that he was far from his usual self. Time yourself, he said, to get to the other end of the arcade at exactly a quarter past nine. There'll be a small coach waiting, driven by a fellow wearing a heavy black cloak, tipped at the collar with red. Don't speak a word to him, just get in. You'll arrive at Victoria just in time for the Continental Express. A compartment will be reserved for us in the second first-class carriage from the front. I'll meet you there. Before I could say a word at all of this, he was gone, through the window, over the garden wall, and away into the night. Well, I, I reached the station by that remarkable route, and everything happened just as Holmes said it would. I collected my bag and found what was supposed to be our reserved compartment, but it was occupied. It was occupied by a venerable Italian priest who was trying in broken English to make a porter understand that his luggage had to be booked through to Paris. There was no sign of Holmes. A chill of fear came over me. I opened the window and stared vainly down the platform as the doors were closed and the whistles blown. Then 
I heard a voice from behind me. My dear Watson, you haven't even condescended to say hello. Yes, it was him, the old priest. I began to laugh with sheer relief, but he silenced me with a glance and dropped his voice to a whisper. They're hot on our tail, Watson. Yes, and there, there, there's the man himself. I looked out and saw a tall figure pushing his way through the crowd, but it was too late. The train had already begun to move. I watched him closely, but he gave up with what looked like good-natured resignation. I turned back to Holmes. Are you telling me that was Moriarty? He nodded grimly. Yes, with all our precautions. Have you seen the morning paper, Watson? No. Ah, then you don't know about Baker Street. They set fire to the house last night. Dear God. I, I asked him if Mrs. Hudson and the maid were all right, and he, he told me that they were undamaged. And so were our rooms. Apparently the fire had been started in the hallway and was discovered before it could spread. And to my utter astonishment, he laughed. Ha! I expected better of Moriarty. And with that, he removed the few elements of his disguise, shoved them into a bag, sat back and closed his eyes. I had a great deal to think about as the train weaved its smoky way through the Kentish countryside. We'd arrived at Canterbury. Holmes suddenly pulled me to my feet and practically pushed me out onto the platform. The train pulled away, taking my bag and my clothes with it. I demanded to know what the devil he was about. I tell you, Moriarty's brain is quite on a level with mine. He's done what I would do. Having missed our express, he would have arranged a special private train to follow ours. There's always a delay at the boat, and he'll plan on catching us there. This was verging on the ridiculous, and I told him so. It takes time to engage a special. The engine has to be found, and so does at least one coach. The line has to be cleared. People have to be informed. Holmes shrugged it off. I tell you, he'll do it. He will do it. And at that moment, I suddenly found myself thrust down behind a pile of luggage on the platform. For pity's sake, Holmes! Quiet, man! Get down! One coach train and moving faster than any I'd ever seen. And at one window, a chilling face scanning the platform with cold, malevolent eyes. It was the man I'd seen at Victoria. It was Moriarty. Holmes looked shrewdly at me. Any more doubts about my mental stability, Doctor? No, no, I hadn't. Of, of course I hadn't. But good grief, had I really been that transparent? He smiled. Only to me... No, not another word. In your position, I'd have been every bit as sceptical. And don't think I didn't appreciate your agreeing to come with me, even if it was only to chart my progress into complete insanity. <laughs> come on, my friend. We made our way cross-country to New Haven, and then over to Dieppe, treating ourselves to a couple of carpet bags and new necessities as we went. We reached Brussels that same night, and the next day moved on to Strasbourg. Holmes telegraphed Scotland Yard on the Monday morning, and the answer arrived the same evening. Holmes tore it open, and then, with a bitter curse, hurled it into the fire. He's escaped. They've got all the principal agents, but he gave them the slip. Incompetent fools! You'll find me a dangerous companion now, Watson. Moriarty will devote his whole energies to revenging himself upon me. You mean he'll, he'll try to follow us, to, to track us down? No question of it. I think you'd better return to England. He must have known how I'd react to that. I pointed out that I was an old campaigner as well as an old friend. I'd never yet let him down when danger was near, and I had no intention of starting then. We argued about it for a good half hour, and then I had my way. I can be every bit as stubborn as Sherlock Holmes if the need arises. I asked him what he planned to do. He considered. 
I believe the best plan is simply to continue as we've begun, and to carry on with our little holiday tour. There are two possible outcomes. I agreed. Either he'll catch up with us, or he'll lose the scent, give up and go back to England. Holmes shook his head. No, he will never do that. His whole occupation's gone, and he's been unmasked now. He'll be lost if he returns to London. Then what did you mean? I asked him. What were the two possibilities? One of Holmes' most infuriating habits was simply to ignore any question he wasn't inclined to answer. He turned away and said nothing. I didn't need to press him. He had told me, as clearly as if he'd spoken out loud, that whatever game he was playing with Moriarty, the stakes were horrendously high. For a week we wandered up the valley of the Rhone and then made our way over the Gemmy Pass, still deep in snow. In the homely alpine villages and the lonely mountains, Holmes' quick glancing eyes took in every face that passed us, but we saw no sign of the danger which dogged our footsteps. It was on the 3rd of May that we reached the charming little village of Meiringen, where we put up at the Englischer Hof Hotel. Our landlord, Peter Steiler, was an intelligent man and spoke excellent English, having served for three years as a waiter at the Grosvenor Hotel in London. <laughs> Holmes deduced this without needing to be told. Steiler was amazed, as most people were when Holmes pulled information seemingly out of mid-air. But this is unglaublich! Herr Holmes, you are ein Gedankenlesser. Doctor, he is a mind reader. Holmes smiled back at him, basking in the praise as he always did. He soaked up applause as avidly as any prima donna. Only at the Grosvenor could you have learned the recipe for tonight's splendid Frickendauer veal, Herr Steiler. Monsieur Remarque's sauce is quite unmistakable. I must say, I'm surprised he revealed it to you. Our host grinned. He was my very good friend. And we laughed. All three of us laughed. Steiler beamed. Oh, this is good, is it not? To hear you laugh so in my hotel, it makes me content. You are content also, Herr Holmes. Yes, Herr Steiler, I am content. It was a magical evening. We sat on the terrace with our fine Swiss beer and gazed at the magnificent view in the evening sunshine. You could see two seasons in a single glance, spring at the foot of the mountains and winter at their peaks. I told Holmes I'd like to bring Mary here. Her health hadn't been too good just lately. He was immediately concerned, but I, I reassured him. It was nothing serious, I said. Nothing to worry about. And this place, that view, it would work wonders for her. Holmes was in one of his philosophical moods. He had said to me more than once that he would have made a formidable criminal, and I believed him. But I wasn't prepared for what he told me that night. That in Moriarty... He saw the man that he could have become. It's true, Doctor. I can see into his mind. I know what drives him, and I understand it completely. There's a beauty to mathematics. It's the quest to impose order and logic and clarity onto a chaotic world. We both follow that quest, Moriarty and I. If his path is by embracing evil and mine by combating it, there's a small enough difference amongst so many similarities... Did Holmes know about the latest medical thinking, or had he come up with this himself? I wouldn't have been surprised. There was a young doctor in Vienna who was making this area his whole life's work, and he, he had some fascinating ideas. I'd been following him closely. The shadow, the dark, buried part of the self that constantly strives to be recognised. i tried sometimes to work out what Freud would have made of my friend... It was my belief that Holmes embraced his shadow. He used its power to channel his vitality and creativity into solving mysteries. He somehow only came fully alive when he had a case. And when there was nothing to occupy his brain, then there came the black depressions, the day-long silences, the drugs, the shadow at work, the duality suddenly made clear. 
Moriarty, though, was a slave to his shadow. It had consumed him. Dense, deep and destructive, it owned his very soul. The man was all shadow. And like a shadow, he was following us. If Holmes had persisted with this line of thought, I was deathly afraid he'd sink back into the blackness himself, further than I could reach and rescue him. Hoping to heaven I was being subtle this time, I tried a tactic I'd used once or twice before. I turned into the version of myself I put into some of the stories, a little slower, a touch more obtuse, rather easily confused. I said, You and Moriarty are alike? Nonsense, Holmes. You're talking about a man whose record is black with unutterable infamies. He saw straight through me, of course. <laughs> Started writing it up already, have you? I've given it some thought. That made him smile, as I'd hoped it would. He loved being rude about my writing. We sat there as the dusk turned to night and the stars began to appear, each of us lost in his own private thoughts. And then, so softly that I almost didn't notice, Holmes spoke again. I think, Watson, I might say that I've not lived wholly in vain. If my record were closed tonight, I could survey it with equanimity. The air of London is the sweeter for my presence. In over a thousand cases, I'm not aware that I have ever used my powers on the wrong side. And now, now I face the most dangerous and capable criminal in Europe. Your memoirs will draw to an end on the day that I crown my career by terminating his activities. This was something entirely unexpected. Was this one of the possibilities he'd talked about? I asked him if he really planned to retire. I will never forget his reply, or the way he said it. My retirement would be a price I'd willingly pay. The next day we decided to follow Peter Steiler's advice and take the long walk to see the fabled waterfalls at Reichenbach. It is a fearful place. The torrent, swollen by the melting snow, plunges past glistening coal-black rocks into a tremendous chasm. And as the long sweep of green water roars forever down, the spray rolls up like the smoke from a burning house. We stood on a narrow path near the edge, peering down at the gleam of the breaking water far below us and listening to the half-human shout which came booming up with the spray out of the abyss. Holmes turned to me. Look at it. A man could spend his life probing the secrets of such a power. This will stretch your pen, Watson. It's a worthy subject for your prose. I was surprised. No sarcasm, Holmes. No comments about cheap romanticism and pandering to the masses. He shook his head. Oh no, my friend. Not here. Not today. As we made our way back to more secure ground, we saw a young Swiss lad running towards us with a note in his hand. It was from Peter Steiler, and it was addressed to me. An English lady had arrived at the hotel and was deathly ill, having suffered a sudden, catastrophic hemorrhage. Steiler believed that she could scarcely last a few more hours, and it surely would be a great comfort to her to see an English doctor. Could I return? I don't think I've, I've ever been so torn between the bonds of friendship and my duty as a doctor. The note was genuine, it was on the hotel's paper, so there was no doubting the situation and the urgency, but... But how could I leave Holmes on his own, knowing the danger? He saw my struggle, and resolved the question himself. He suggested that the young Swiss messenger could remain with him as guide and companion, while I returned to Myringen. My friend would stay some little time at the falls, he said, and would then walk slowly over the hill to the next village, where I could catch up with him later. As I hurried away, I, 
I turned back briefly. Holmes was standing with his back against a rock and his arms folded, gazing down at the rush of the waters. It must have been a little over an hour before I reached Myringen. Old Steiler was standing at the porch of his hotel. I trust she's no worse, I said. A look of surprise passed over his face, and my heart turned to lead. I didn't wait for any explanations. I cursed my damn leg as I tried to hurry, and for all my efforts it took me nearly two hours to climb back up to the falls. Holmes! Holmes! Calm down. Think. Think. He's gone on to the village just as we planned. He'll be waiting there. Oh, God. God. Holmes's stick was still leaning on the rock where I'd last seen him. Holmes! I was cold and sick with the horror of the thing. But then I thought of Holmes's own methods and tried to apply them. It was all too easy to do. In the damp, black soil, I could make out fresher footprints than ours from earlier. One set, moving lightly away back down the path. That must have been the Swiss lad. And, only partially obscured by my own steps, a heavier, more deliberate track. Someone new had approached Holmes while I wasn't there. And then, the two of them had moved off together along the path to the edge of the falls. Two men had made their way there. Neither had returned. And the ground at the very brink of the precipice was churned and gouged. Dear God, they must have fought hand to hand. Holmes! Holmes! Suddenly, the gleam of something caught my eye. It was Holmes's silver cigarette case lying on a rock, and something was trapped beneath it. A note. I was destined to have a last word from my friend and comrade. The writing was as firm and precise as if he'd been at his desk in Baker Street. My dear Watson, I write these few lines through the courtesy of Mr. Moriarty, who awaits my convenience for the final discussion of those questions which lie between us. I am pleased to think that I shall be able to free society from any further effects of his presence, though I fear that it will be at a cost which will give pain to my friends, and especially, my dear Watson, to you. I have already explained to you, however, that no possible conclusion to my career could be more congenial to me than this. Indeed, if I may make a full confession to you, I was quite convinced that the letter from Myringham was a hoax. I made every disposition of my property before leaving England and handed it to my brother Mycroft. Pray give my greetings to Mrs. Watson and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes. It was impossible to recover the bodies. There, in that dreadful cauldron of swirling water and seething foam, will lie for all time the most dangerous criminal and the foremost champion of the law of their generation. The powers of fate pay little heed to mere mortal men. 
Holmes knew that. Not six months after I returned from Switzerland, I suddenly realised that Mary, my kind, gentle, lovely, loving wife Mary, was far more ill than either of us had realised. And I, I... I could do nothing. I had to sit at her bedside and watch her simply being taken away from me. At the end, as I was holding her hand, she managed to open her eyes and speak. It was scarcely more than a breath. Oh, John, first Mr. Holmes, and now me, everyone you love. I'm so, so very sorry. She, she apologised, apologised. And then she was gone. And I was alone again. I was at my lowest ebb since I'd arrived back home from Afghanistan years before, half dead with no hope of any future. No, this was worse. Far worse. I'd seen that future. I'd lived it. I'd gloried in it. And now it had been stolen and could never come back. My old service revolver. A souvenir and not just of my time in the army. This had been a friend to me far more recently than that. Some of the dangers we'd faced. And I still had some bullets. Yes, I considered it. Dear Lord, I, I really did. Came close too. Honestly, Watson, is it really necessary to be quite so melodramatic? Oh. The wretched man was still in my head, <laughs> thank God. And so was Mary, of course. I could suddenly see the look on her face, the disappointment, the anger. And I was furious too, furious with myself. Was this the man that she fell in love with? No, it was not. Oh. I tried to lose myself in my work, but my practice had never been particularly absorbing, even in happier days, and I found that nothing had changed. I still had stories to write, of course. I decided that if Mycroft Holmes hadn't wanted his brother's death to be public knowledge, he must have had a damn good reason, though God alone knows what that might be. So no one was going to learn about it from me. I kept writing. I was cagey about dates and times without ever actually lying about things, and I would have carried on too until I finally ran out of material. But then, just recently, my hand was forced. Letters to the Times, demanding a full and immediate official inquiry into the disappearance of Professor James Moriarty. <laughs> Sir, I call upon the Home Secretary and the Commissioner of Police to provide urgent and public explanations. I have long had documented evidence of the prolonged persecution of this respected and highly distinguished scientist and academic by the self-styled consulting detective, Mr Sherlock Holmes. But now there has come into my possession irrefutable proof of the Professor's cold-blooded murder by the same hand. <laughs> There have been more on the same lines. You might have seen them, all from Moriarty's brother. He's an army man, a colonel, and if you ask me, he's a damn disgrace to the rank. There's been no official response. I tried to reach Mycroft to ask his advice, but, but the man's impossible to get hold of. It's almost as though he doesn't exist. But I am not having this. The rumours have already started. The loose assumptions, the false stories... Soon they'll come the scandal-mongering, the out-and-out -out lies, the headlines designed purely to sell the papers, those rags. It's become near impossible sometimes to tell fact from falsehood. What's happened to the world? So, 
I've decided to take matters into my own hand and the hell with any consequences. I alone know the truth and I mean to see the truth told. The account's written and I'm sending it to the Strand magazine tomorrow and that will be that. I've decided that I shan't write up any more cases. It wouldn't be respectful. Let the poor man rest in peace. Here. So, in an incoherent, and as I deeply feel, an entirely inadequate fashion, I have tried to give some account of my many strange experiences in the company of the world's first and only private consulting detective. But now, with a heavy heart, I lay down my pen. These have been the last words in which I shall ever record the singular gifts of my friend, Mr Sherlock Holmes whom I shall ever regard as the best and the wisest man whom I have ever known. And there it is. The Final Problem. Not a bad title, perhaps, for the final story. No more Sherlock Holmes for me. No more Sherlock Holmes for anyone. Still, we had a damn good run. So, what now, eh? What does the world hold for John H. Watson, MD, late of the 5th Northumberland Fusiliers? I've been doctor, soldier, husband, detective. What's next? Well, if I've learned anything at all from my long association with Mr. Sherlock Holmes, it's this. Always expect the unexpected. There might be something wonderful, something incredible, just around the corner. Ha! Ah! You see? Come in! Watson, The Final Problem, was performed by Tim Marriott and produced by Bert Cools for Smokescreen Productions. Music was created and performed by Clive Whitburn. If you enjoyed this recording, please do consider making a donation. Thank you for listening. <laughs>